Okay, let's get, let's get started. Thank you, thank you everybody for coming. I just want everyone to know that I post, I'm going to post this conference on um, the internet, so just okay. make sure you don't mention names, um, et cetera. All right. And um, this is a, going to be a great conference because we have four specialties represented. Dr. Seeger is a pathologist, Dr. Horvick, a radiation oncologist, Dr. Min, who is the oncologist, and we're all familiar with this case, and I'm the orthopedic surgeon, and we have a couple, we have, we'll have more than one orthopedic surgeon. And we're going to talk about a pathologic fracture of the femur. So just <clears throat> in a brief review, the last uh, statistics, the most recent statistics I could find from cancer in Maryland was from 2007. Do you know, Dr. Min, any more recent study, any more recent data? National, data, like, you yeah. See your data, like uh, they can be updated. We go by that. Yeah, by national data mostly. Yeah, this is the only one I could find for specifically for Maryland, and um, as you can see, prostate is by far the most common for men, followed by lung, colorectal, urinary bladder. Uh, for women, uh, breast by far is is the most common cancer. Again, lung, but lung is not as high as men. But I think didn't they catch up a little bit? Um, it's really, it looks like this is this is not like a metastatic disease that goes all cancer, yeah, can, all cancer. Yeah. Yeah. So that's pretty conforming to the national. You think, Doctor Horvitz? Absolutely. Yeah. That, Do you think uh, for Maryland, um, uh, the breast and lung, like a female, though, you know, then uh, that, that, that part, then uh, I think lung that uh, lately is like the number one now, and then uh, breast for you women. Know, it's like a, yeah, women nationally. That, uh, mm -hmm. nationally Women smokers, the men kind of learn the learn the lesson hard way, so they start cutting cutting back on smoking, and then uh, young women kept on smoking, and then uh, the incidence of lung cancer in women started rising. I think overseas did breast now. Mm, in the last five couple of years, yes, I guess. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Last. Yeah, the incidence is up, but the problem is it's not a problem. But women with breast cancer live longer. So if you just look at cancer. There are more women that are running around with breast cancer. That is the women that get lung cancer, they they're, live, they're quick statistics. They, they live with the disease longer. Breast cancer, yeah. yeah. This is the incidence, looks like. Right, it's incidence, pretty, right. So I would suspect if you go to 100,000 people, it's the people that are alive with the, uh, with the cancer. So just, just to review, I know everybody knows this, how, how does something metastasize end up? Also, I just want everybody to know, if you want to interrupt me or just tell me I'm wrong or add something, please interrupt me anytime. Um, the neoplasm has to become created. Uh, it has to become vascularized so it can grow. It has to invade the vessel. It, then it has to embolize through the vessels. And then uh, it uh, seeds itself, usually uh, in the metaphysis where the blood sludges. Uh, it has to leave the vessels, and then in the new area, it has to grow. So all these steps have to occur. Um, the most common three sites uh, for metastatic disease are lung, liver, and bone. Um, any, do you want to, anyone want to comment uh, on those basics? Prostate preferentially goes above? Yeah, you're right. I think there is this you know, crosstalk between the micro environment, you know, the bone environment, liver, lungs, first, and then the cancer cell that is the, the serving expression of this, you know, the adhesion molecules. And then, uh, that is how the metastases kind of partly mm -hmm. into, into, you know, they happen at one side, sparing other mm -hmm. Okay. So um, just as a general review, the most common, common metastatic disease to bones are breast, prostate, lung, uh, renal, uh, blood tumors, thyroid. And in general, 70% of all metastatic disease goes to um, bone. Uh, as far as how do they present, uh, Doug, how do you think, how do bone meds present to you? Because usually they don't present to the oncologist or the radiation oncologist, they present to the orthopedic surgeon. What do you think? Night pain. Night pain. And what's your? I have my own personal theory why it hurts at night. What's your theory? 
I don't have a personal theory. Okay. okay. Spiro's personal. Huh? Sure. <laughs> Spiro's personal theory is um, is the gate <clears throat> the gate theory of pain, where there's so many afferents that can go into uh, your spinal cord and be transmitted up to your brain. So just like the football player who doesn't notice the uh, MCL injury until after the game, there's too many stimuli going on. There's only so many stimuli that can go up to the brain to be registered. Same thing in the office. Um, you may have something that hurts, your back may hurt, but you've got to get through your 20 patients or your secretary scream at you or whatever. So you just, you just uh, um, tough it out and you don't notice the back pain until you're home or you're relaxing. So when you're at night and all is at rest and there's no other stimuli affecting you, um, that's when the bone pain comes out. Does that make sense? That's like a, you know, like in the 1980s, I guess, like a reading on that. Uh, it is the gravity, partly gravity effect that, that uh, you know, being recumbent, like at uh, nighttime, that, that uh, more blood flow, hyperemic, and then that, that is more in that, that's, you know, the pain, more pain, more bone pain. From hyperemia? So, uh, that is what I, that's 1980s reading. Sorry about that. Like, that's so okay, that's okay. No, I want to hear it. The teaching molecules part is like a 20%. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, well, that's interesting. Okay, so this is this is the case we're going to present. This is I'm not going to read this whole slide, but uh, and I and I like to go over cases because they're real people that we take care of, and you can will never forget it. It's a 78 year old man who's referred to me by a neurologist. So he went to the primary care physician, then went to the neurologist, then came to me with uh, right sided thigh pain. Uh, he had two month two months of uh, symptoms, and he had to use a walker. His pain was six out of ten. And it was worse when he walked and felt better when he sat. Also, not only did he say it was painful, but it was weak, and he said his thigh was numb. So, unfortunately, I'm a spine surgeon, so the first thing I thought was, this is coming from his spine, and he came with an MRI. Um, he did have a history 18 months prior, uh, had a right upper lobe lobectomy thoracoscopically, with medial stinal lymph node sampling of adenocarcinoma resected in April 2010, which was 18 months prior to when I saw him. And he had the path stated extensive angiolymphatic invasion of the tumor with small vessel involvement and involvement of peritracheal nodes. So, what, Dr. Seeker, what is that? I don't know what that means. What does that mean? What do you mean? What, what's, what's the significance of that? Well, can you imagine a tumor that is not located inside the parenchyma, or rather it has spread to the lymphatic or even the angio component of the lung, and therefore it has a, a great potential to metastasize. At that time, the, I think it was a stage, let me see how it was a stage. It was T2N2N2. Uh, yes, PT2A. Uh, and pl uh, plural surface, as I see here, um, the, apparently the elastic membrane of the pleura, the visceral pleural, was permeated, but the serosal surface wasn't affected. That's what I read by PL1. And he had, uh, I think, a couple of lymph nodes. Let me see how many. Um, he, the, the pathologist couldn't count the lymph nodes because they were fragmented the pieces uh, we receive, and therefore it's not known whether they were one fragmented or several. So um, uh, he is here uh, stage at SPN2. So how, Dr. Min, how would this patient, you treat this patient? Because they would, they would uh, go to you in consultation. You know, this is the kind of patient that uh, the, the uh, TNN staging, that uh, it is, to me, that they're not really reflecting true extent of, of the, the, uh, the metastatic potential, you know, the relapse potential of this disease. So T2N2, then, uh, that, uh, it will be like a 3A, stage 3A disease, you know, that, uh, but with extensive this angiolymphatic invasion, also like, I think, tumor nodules, too, in the same lobe. Like, uh, currently, the, the current TNS classification will put him at T3, I don't know, like at stage 3A, standard of care is chemotherapy and radiation, concurrent chemotherapy and radiation. We would consider the cure rate around like 20, 25%. But this man, that uh, the way it presented, he can't get away that uh, with this extensive spread of the disease. There'll be micro metastases, like, uh, you know, most likely.
likely some way uh, that uh, you know already the the time of diagnosis. So, um, so that that is my my uh, initial thought that, that uh, when I saw him first time when he presented with DVT or TV in October. Oh, so he presented in October. So. Um, Dr. Martin, can you can you come here? Can you sit with, next to? We're recording the conference, so I want to be able to hear you. So this so this patient, I don't know if you had read the chart, but um, um, I did last night. Yes. Oh, okay, great. So just tell us tell us how you would treat this um, uh, tumor. What do you what exactly do you do? Uh, well, if I see a patient with a new nodule, um, I think from what I read that this nodule had been followed for a year or two and was gradually enlarging. Um, then when I see a patient like that, the first thing I do is get a PET scan. I don't think this patient had a PET scan before surgery. Uh, I saw I one after surgery. Okay, I don't think so either. Um, and that's follows the guidelines, standard of care, um, because at the time of resection, every single lymph node that was taken out was positive, and that should have showed up on the PET scan. And in fact, the PET scan done after surgery had an SUV of four in the right femur. I think there was some activity. Um, and no, post-op from the lobectomy? May 2010, there was some activity in the femur. Okay. I can show you the report. Um, so, and I'm not sure, you know, he was, the patient was at, uh, treated adjuvantly at the University of Maryland, and they didn't seem to really comment on that femur issue. And I think the patient had any symptoms. Yeah. Uh, but normally you get some plain films or further evaluation. My question about this media sign of limited sampling, that, that what are your thoughts on this, you know, this sampling that, uh, you know, a few pieces of lymph nodes and then, uh, yeah. that uh, they cannot really, uh, you know, they, they, they right to count the lymph nodes and all, see well, where Well, the problem is when sampling. we get um, many pieces. Uh, oh, that uh, happens all the time. Yes. I mean, and so how do you happens. count that? Do you count them as individual lymph nodes, as pieces of lymph nodes? And uh, that, there's no good answer to that, yeah. but it happens all the time. You go pick them up and they just break. Yeah. And so you can't really say how yeah. many. And I, I think there aren't really clear, whereas with colon and some other malignancies, there's clear-cut guidelines wow. for number of lymph nodes assessed. Um, there was recently a very large study, an ACASOG study, that <laughs> looked at mediastinal lymphadenectomy versus mediastinal lymph node sampling. And I actually participated in that study as a fellow. We enrolled a huge number of patients. And they found no, and this is for stage one patients, but not patients that are PET positive all over the place. It's a different situation. Um, but they found no difference in survival and, or outcomes at all, whether you take, as long as you're sampling different areas, you don't have to clean out every node from the different areas. It doesn't seem to matter. And I, I don't think anyone studied that for more advanced disease. It would seem that the more you take out, the better. But on the other hand, normally we wouldn't want to do surgery up front on a patient with extensive mediastinal Sample of at your discretion that uh, you know the way that the structural field is there, then um, wouldn't you be like uh, compromising the sampling, like uh, you know, like breast, and you know, we have the, the more kind of directed sample of those type of you know colon that there was some right. attempts made before. Well, that's exactly the question that was asked, and that's why this huge study was done. It was like 1,500 patients or something. It was that was exactly the question people had: is is it is it is there a survival benefit? out all the lymph nodes and that you're getting a better assessment of, of the extent of disease or is it better to just say, I mean, we all have anecdotal cases. I just did a lobe on a one centimeter peripheral adenocarcinoma and I did a mediastinal lymphadenectomy because I was there and 13, I think you read this, 13 nodes were taken out, one was positive. Totally unexpected, didn't show up on the PET, never would have guessed that for a peripheral one centimeter lesion. But if I didn't sample all those nodes, I'm sure I wouldn't have found that. Um, so we all have seen that, so we assume that taking out more lymph nodes is better, but this large study didn't bear that out. But again, I think this case is an example of it's very important that you do an appropriate workup up front so that you can recommend the appropriate treatment up front. Now, my sense is this guy probably had stage four disease from the beginning. He shouldn't have gone to surgery. I mean, that's his initial management. He didn't have the appropriate workup before surgery. He should have been completely staged. If a patient has metastatic disease or if they have, medias, if they have gross mediastinal involvement by cancer, 
surgery as the initial management yeah. is non-standard, so he shouldn't have gone there. Um, chemotherapy, if he's metastatic disease, chemotherapy by itself is standard. If he's just got lymph node, <coughs> lymph node involvement within the mediastinum, radiation plus chemotherapy is standard. But surgery is recommended when it has curative potential, and it didn't have curative potential in this patient. I just, I just found the report. It said there was uptake in the femur, but no CT correlate to go with it, which I think, and the patient didn't have any symptoms, right? And no CT correlate means the CT was not performed or the CT was normal? The CT was normal. It's a PET oh. CT scan, so there's plain CT images that go okay. with the PET, and that there was nothing. Would you have recommended an MRI if you were suspicious? Would that be more sensitive? They're supposedly they're the same. Uh, MRI, uh, PET scan, bone scans have the same sensitivity, but I, I'm not sure if you, if you combine the two. They're both extremely high, but uh, it's obviously suspicious. So if you, if you had an asymptomatic patient but had FDG uptake in their uh, greater trochanter with this presentation, then how would you all have worked this up and how would you have treated it? This is, not an an this, is not, this is not an orthopedic problem. This is a radiation oncology problem. Right. My mind. Well, right. sure. So, so, but then would you have had to get tissue to prove it before you would radiate it if it was just a pet abnormality, or how would you? Well, if he's asymptomatic, I wouldn't radiate it. Mm -hmm. He has metastatic disease, and he needs chemotherapy, and chemotherapy potentially would control it. And again, just because a person has a bone met, if it's asymptomatic, it may never progress to the point of right. being symptomatic or getting to the point of risk of pathologic fracture. But yet, uh, especially if you're going to consider taking the patient to surgery, as you said, if the pet had been done first and if you'd seen this, I think getting tissue to make sure that you weren't doing an inappropriate surgery would be the right thing. Yeah, but if he's got uptake of his greater trochanter, you would watch that. If he's got uptake of his lesser trochanter, that's an indication for fixation. Because on the lesser trochanter, that's a that's where you break like that. Greater, you know, it, it might be semantics to you, but to someone who's looking at it, lesser trochanter is an indication for pen, for uh, prophylactic. Low, yeah, fixation. lower threshold for surgery. If it's lesser, lesser troch. troch. So when you know when you say hip, it's like, hmm. but if it's lesser troch or on the inside border of the femur, that gets fixed. So, but if you had seen this PET scan up front, would you what imaging? Would well, I don't know. They say recommend an MRI. I'd probably follow it very closely. I, it, it really says femoral neck, and femoral neck or lesser trochanter, that's a high-risk uh, area. That's, that's the highest risk in the body. But, but so what, what test would you do? I might get an MRI. Okay. Um, okay, so um, let me ask the, uh, Dr. Martin a question. So let's say I usually order bone scans on patients when I have a solitary tumor. I order a bone scan. Should I be ordering a PET scan? Uh, I would say that the number of bone scans I've, I've ordered in the last five years is I can count on one hand because I think the PET scans, for the most part, is going to pick things up. To rule out a metastatic disease. So I should be ordering PET scans then. The only, only problem with the PET scan is that the protocol is to go to the lower thighs. So if there's symptoms to drive you to look somewhere else, you need to get other imaging or you have to specifically request a whole body PET. The only time they do the whole body, I think, is for Melanoma. Yeah, but they do they do whole body PET it, scans. The, but the whole body really means to the lower thighs. Well, if I say from head to toes, you they have will to do specifically it. order it that way, though. Right, it's but I can easily routine. do that every time. Mm -hmm. So it's better for me to say PET scan of the entire body from head to toes than the bone scan. For, for, well, I mean, it depends on the solid tumor type, but for lung, for sure. Lung, they but some they're some solid work. tumors aren't very FDG avid, and so you, which ones are not? If um, uh, bladder and um, no renal point. cell sometimes not so good. Um, I think sarcomas are plus minus. Are bone scans and PET scans equally sensitive? Bone well, scans supposed to be a little bit more sensitive for bone. So okay. again, yeah. if you're specifically, I think as an orthopedist specific, specifically looking for bone problems, right. the bone scan is a little bit more sensitive. We're interested in total body, so the relative sensitivity for what we're doing, PET scan's covering everything, so it's important to us. But I think if you're looking for, for a specific bone problem, mm. there is increased sensitivity with the bone scan. Okay. Does anybody else want to comment? So let's, let's keep moving. So this man came to me with five pain, and here is x-rays. Um,
Doug, what do you think of his x-rays? Right thigh pain. Yeah, I mean, it's not a trick question, just... Um, unremarkable. Looks like he has a lot of degenerative disease in his lumbar spine. Okay, so he has diffuse osteophytes emanating from the disc space. The disc spaces are well-maintained. So this is sort of like a picture of diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis, in my mind, anyway. And here's his MRI scan. And this is not spine conference, so I won't get into it in great detail, but you can see the 3-4 disc is very flat. There's a huge spur in the front. Uh, and the 3-4 uh, canal is very tight, and the foramen is very tight at 3-4. The L3 nerve root goes into the thigh. So this made in, uh, good sense to me that it was coming from his spine. The neurologist thought the same thing as well. So this is an unfortunate circumstance where this patient had two coexistent concomitant problems uh, that went to the same exact area. The other, thing, the, the other thing that I thought was unusual is the left was worse than the right. So I thought to myself, this doesn't make sense. But sometimes things don't make sense. And uh, uh, I only was going to decompress the right side because this is the only symptomatic side. So the plan in this man was lumbar decompression, L3, L4 foramen, to help him with his thigh symptoms. Um, so some time went by in this man because whenever you see a surgeon, uh, if the surgeon is reasonably busy, it's about two or three weeks until they can go to surgery. So what happened before, the ER called me and said that he's in the ER. I was like, well, he's, not, he's scheduled for elective surgery. What's he doing in the ER? He broke his femur. So I was like, uh-oh. So what do you think of the um, x-rays here, Doug? He's got a um, subtroke fracture. It looks like it's through a lesion. It's highly suspicious. It looks like there's involvement from the femoral neck to the mid shaft of the femur. Why tell everybody why he's you think it's suspicious? Well, he's got endosteal scalloping. So it's, uh, See these punched out lesions? Um, and they're diffuse, right? Diffuse, and he's got, um, uh, he's got permeative uh, disease where the lateral cortex and in the greater trochanter, you can't see any bone. It's basically all mm -hmm. just eaten away. Okay, so, so uh, issues on, on masses is the, how big is it? Is the cortex involved? Is there a periosteal reaction? And then the other, in orthopedics anyway, if you have um, um, an isolated aggressive bony lesion, if the patient's over 40, unfortunately I'm in that age group, is kind of old, and that means, <laughs> that means that there's an extremely high likelihood that this is a metastatic disease, 500 to 1, but it's not zero. There is a chance that this could be a primary sarcoma of bone, which for us is a huge deal because the treatment's very different. So here's the uh, lateral. Um, so what would you do with this patient, Doug, if he was admitted to the uh, ER? What's your, what's your next step? Work up or mail him? Call Dr. Min and say help? <clears throat> what would you do? Uh, you know, given his past history of having had an adenocarcinoma of the lung, I presume it's metastatic disease, he'd get fixed. Basically, you have to fix him before you want to do anything, before oncology or anyone else can help him. You've got to fix him, get rid of his pain. So you don't call Dr. Min yet? Nah. How about Dr. Main? If he came, if he came and he was your patient, someone called me. <laughs> yeah. What would happen if they called you and they said your patient's in the ER and his thigh hurts and by the way he has a fracture? What would you do? You need to fix it first. Fix it first. Okay. Okay. So there's a couple, there's a couple issues in, in orthopedics. If you have a pathologic fracture of unknown um, primary diagnosis, you need to do a workup, and I'll tell you why. You need to get blood work uh, to see if uh, serum protein electrophoresis to check if it's uh, multiple myeloma. And I think it's absolutely necessary you need a calcium. The reason is, um, my personal reason is my best friend's mother, my best friend who's an oncologist, his mother died from halpercalcemia from cancer, and, it, and it's, the calcium was never checked. And ever since then, I check the calcium on every on every patient with cancer. But that's a per, that's a personal reason, um, and uh, other uh, tests. And now, as far as the radiographic workup, if you have an unknown origin, it was it was def this is a great article in 1993. I was in residency when I read this, and I think it still holds true today. You need to do a workup, and there's five reasons. Uh, you need to get it. I'll tell you the workup. The workup is a bone scan of the whole body a CAT scan of the chest, abdomen, pelvis with, um, with dye, both oral and IV, and a chest x-ray and labs. And the reason is this workup 
will give you the primary site in 85% of cases, which is great, because you know what the diagnosis is before the surgery, and this usually can be done within 24 hours. So the reason to do this is, first of all, you have to see if this is a primary sarcoma of bone. If it is, it has to be resected with margins. Um, the other thing is it may show you an easier biopsy site. So if there's a toe involved that you can just stick a needle in a toe, that's a lot better than uh, cutting open the femur. Uh, the other thing is if it's renal cell, you need to know about that because renal cell can bleed incredibly. Have you, have you ever done a renal cell case? I, I've done like three. I remember I had one of the spine. It was the, Actually, I think it was the first renal cell done at Mercy. I did it on a weekend, and um, it bled one liter within 30 seconds. And um, so I had, I was ready though, I stopped it, but it was, they're extremely vascular. And we also did the pre-embolic um, workup. So you send it to interventional radiology and they embolize as many vessels as they can. So you need to know if it's renal cell. Um, the other thing is that you may not need to do a biopsy because the workup may give you the diagnosis. And the other thing is you want to help Dr. Seeger because then you have a lot of information when you send the biopsy right. results, right? Yeah, so let me say what we got with this biopsy. Hold, 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 hold the operative diagnosis was uh, right hip proximal femur peritrochanteric fracture. Wait, wait, one second. That's it. Wait, uh, hold, what? <laughs> what did you say? That's it. That's right what we got. Right hip proximal femur peritrochanteric right. fracture? That's it. I'm sorry about that. I told them history of lung cancer. I rest my case. Okay. <laughs> I was bad. I was a bad doctor. I'm sorry. Spiro, I'll tell you what. I've got in the habit. I write on the pack sheet myself when I walk into the OR because... Half the time, what I say to the scrub nurse does not get translated right, onto the sheet. Right, right, I know, or I know. Or it's, it's written down, in, or like I'm taking pleural biases and they put lung, I mean. I know, hey, you're right, I should have. I should start doing that when I need the, when I care. Look up, just a quick comment, that to, to, to the full carcinoma of the primary, you know, a quick workup from within, and then uh, from the beginning, and uh, this is like a lung primary, so, you know, don't really like an extensive workup. But uh, I don't think that we had the CAT scan done, though. It was, you know, the, 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 this man's case is like a, looks like a metastatic lung. And then, right, we did not order CAT scan for you also. For this fracture? Yeah. I did. Oh, the, you did. I did. Cat, I do. I always do. CAT scan, chest, abdomen, pelvis, and uh, bone scan the entire body. The CAT scan, was, everything was negative. The bone scan just lit up the femur. So the, the workup was um, uh, not so helpful. Now. <clears throat> but I'll tell you, too, I'm hoping with this new cancer center that we're going to have on site, and this is a case where it might be, you know, if you didn't have a history of stage 3A lung cancer where your pretest probability is extremely high that this is metastatic lung, if you didn't know all that and the person just came in with an isolated fracture, I mean, this is a case where it might be really helpful to get an inpatient PET scan. And to do that now, we've got to put him in an ambulance and put him down the road, but hopefully we're going to have that PET scanner on site do at they, some point. Does, do insurance companies pay for inpatient PETs? I know that's an issue. I'll tell you what, though, they do it at the university hospital all the time. Okay. Um, but I've experienced that. I mean, I know that because there's a lot, a lot of pushback of on that. You have to be discharged to have your PET. Well, sure, but I think bizarre. I think there may be exceptions, and this is a type of case. You where don't get paid for tests. You get paid for diagnosis, right? No. Okay. <laughs> we'll talk about it later. So, but anyway, th issue. I mean, so you might because your algorithm came from 1993, you may want to add PET to it because it wasn't around. And that's why I was asking and all these questions. It might be useful to you guys in these cases. Well, so. the orthopedic, I did a, a, a literature search. In the orthopedic literature, there is no, there is no such research yet. I, I did a PubMed search before I, I gave this talk. So maybe I need to do another one, but I don't think so. I don't think it's been reviewed so far. In the last uh, Journal of, of American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, we have this yellow journal that gives reviews. That, that they cited the 1993 article. But anyway, we'll keep going. So the other thing that we use as orthopedic surgeons is Merrill's classification with tumors of the femur, whether to nail them or not. And um, you, there's a score that you can do, one, two, three, if it's in the upper, lower, or trochanter, like Doug said, trochanters are more likely to fracture. How much of the cortex is involved? If it's over two-thirds, you get a three. If it's lytic, you get a three. If the score goes uh, to nine, you should probably fix it. If it's eight, you have to use your judgment. If it's seven, you can just observe it. So in this guy, it, let's let's do Merrill's classification for this man. Let's say it didn't fracture yet. It's at the trochanter, so he, get, he gets three. Those lesions are about two-thirds. He gets another three. That's six. It was lytic. That's nine. 
So uh, his pain was very functional uh, because he couldn't walk. So it's 12, so he's way above uh, 9. So he would have been prophylactically rotted. Now this, this is just um, a way to kind of help us, a guide that we can use. The biggest problem for us as orthopedic surgeons is do not nail this tumor because this is osteosarc. If we nail the tumor, it should be resected with margins. If we nail that tumor, the tumor goes all over the femur, and then uh, big difference, right, um, Dr. Horvick, um, if you have to cover the whole femur versus... Sure, absolutely. The uh, risk with radiation when you're giving high dose is subsequent fractures of the normal bone. So sarcomas require high-dose radiation. And uh, because you're involving a lot of normal bone, you'll affect osteoblasts, and you have an increased risk of fracture because of the radiation down the line. Okay. So, so the issues for orthopedics is also what kind of biopsy, intralesional biopsy leaves gross tumor. If you, if you try to excise the tumor through uh, the zone of um, a reactive zone, you leave microscopic tumor, and if you do a wide margin, uh, where there's a cuff of normal tissue, you should get it all out unless there's a skip lesion. And the solitary bone meds that have the best di uh, chance of survival, increased survival if you remove them, are thyroid and renal cell. Um, I won't get into that. So, Doug, how would you approach this? Would, are you, with the information that you have now, are you convinced it's metastatic lung cancer? Uh, 99%. Right, and if you go by... 78-year-old guy. It's actually greater than 99 percent. Treatment's the same. Statistically speaking, it's 500 to one that it's that it's a metastatic disease. If it's since he's over 40 years of age, and the fact that he has metastatic disease is probably even higher than that. So, okay, so I took him to the OR and uh, I made an incision uh, over the fracture and I scooped out a lot of soft tissue tumor. And I didn't do just remings because I feel in my mind the best way, the pathologists are always complaining that we don't have enough, um, <laughs> right? You always complain you don't have enough tissue, done. right? Yeah, and we go on. Oh, they ne <laughs> no matter what. They want more, pay you're supposed to send more specimen to the pathologist than you do back to the floor. No, 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 you're supposed to. No, no, whatever's heaviest, you send no, the ICU. No, that's not the rule. The, the rule is you only send half of what you have to pathology, so they complain, and then you send the other half, and then they stop complaining. But if you send it all, then you have to you waste a lot of time getting more. So I, sc I scooped this out, and I thought I got a lot. I did not send it for frozen, because I felt, first of all, we did it at night. Uh, I felt I was convinced this is metastatic disease from lung cancer, statistically, and from his story, and from the picture, and everything. Um, after I, and you can see the fracture is perfectly reduced, but after I put in the nail, it bent back into varus, which I was extremely disappointed because that's not good. Um, there's a chance that now this nail could break because it's not perfectly aligned. It's 15 degrees of varus. Um, the, the other option I had surgically is open the whole femur up and get it reduced perfectly and then re-nail it. But in this 78-year-old man, I just felt didn't feel the risks or the benefits of, because uh, so, I did this through, per, as a, uh, through a percutaneous technique as it is now. I mean, would you accept this, uh, Doug, or would you open it? Absolutely. And, Absolutely accept it. Yeah, so, the, I mean, we can argue about that, but that's not really interesting to anybody but me or Doug. So, um, so he can't, the other, the other thing we can do is put cement. And the other thing uh, I would like to tell you, Doug, is that is if it's an easy fracture to reduce, put the nail in, then back the nail out, squirt cement in, and then push the nail back in, and it gives you more immediate stability. And but see, this case is hard because it's real hard to reduce that subtrope. So I don't, I don't think I could have done that. Um, okay, so now uh, Dr. Seeger is going to go over the path. All right, great. So we we indeed got a lot of material from Dr. Okay, Antoniadis. We got Thank a you, um, multiple pieces of osseous and. Uh, and soft tissue, and the measurement was two by one and a half by 0.6. So we got, we cannot complain. And when I got the, um, we did one cassette, which we decalcified, and the other not, not decalcification, which is, is important because if you have problems in the immune staining, as we did further on, we cannot blame it on the decal. So we, we had perfect material this time. And when I 
first saw this, uh, it was obvious, uh, at least for us, for a pathologist, <coughs> this is the pony being destroyed here, and a lot of material that shouldn't be there. It's not bone marrow, it's metastatic disease, it's obvious, it's an adenocarcinoma. Little glands here forming uh, and secreting mucus. So at this point in time, I put a preliminary. We, uh, we received, when we are about to sign a case, we received the previous material on the patient. So I knew without uh, looking at the uh, history that the patient had an adenocarcinoma back in 2010. And therefore, I said, well, I'll, I'll get rid of this case in 24 hours because I'm going to do the immunostaining that is, uh, you know, will give me the answer that this is a metastatic carcinoma from the lung. And the stains, uh, just to give you an idea, that the, the cells are well differentiated cells, adenocarcinoma, no doubt. Uh, so um, we did a couple of stainings. Uh, we compare first with the lung tumor, and it has the same glands. Here is the ink pleural surface. Uh, these are the glands, very similar what we had in the, in the metastasis. And music arming done at that time uh, was positive. And you can see here, it's not very good, but you can see it here inside the, the glands and also in the, in the lumen of the glands. Uh, so uh, the, the tumor in the bone um, is here. You see the bone here, this is the tumor. It's also music arming positive. The problem with this tumor is that when we did the CK7 keratin, the CK20 keratin, and the TTF1, which is a three are the three uh, stains that we do in the basic uh, working of the case, the TTF1, instead of being positive as in the original tumor, it was negative. So that- The TTF1 uh, is specific for what type yes, of tumor? Is lung and thyroid. It could be, depending on the sensitivity of the antibody you use, it might be positive in others. But basically, when you have a tumor that is CK7 positive, CK20 negative, TTF1 positive, you think of lung. So the initial biopsy that he had 18 months ago was TTF positive. Exactly. But now the femur is, is not TTF, is negative. Right. So we, we were facing with a problem. So I went to... Um, this is a fracture site for CTF1, totally negative. So what I did um, is the same thing, higher power. What I did is a new marker right now that is an absin A, which is supposed to be a specific for lung adenocarcinoma, also for uh, sometimes kidney, but mainly for lung. So what I did, I, I did an absin on the old case to see how it reacted. Because sometimes, you know, the specificity and sensitivity, especially of these markers. How long do you keep right. the tumor in the lab? Oh, at least for uh, five years. Five block. years? Okay, yeah. so you went to the original one. And what, what did it show? Right. Napsin positive. So it's obviously the lung. It was in the lung. It's the lung tumor. So how did the so tumor lose the marker? That's a problem. And, uh, uh, oops. I thought I had more. That's it. Okay. Um, the the tumor was an absent in the in the femur was an absent negative, so we have a tumor that is supposed to be an absent positive because the main tumor or the original tumor was an absent positive. It is negative, and we have a tumor who which was in the past TTF one positive now is negative. So there are several possibilities, and I spoke with at that time I contacted Dr. Min because I knew that he knew the patient. And uh, we decided that we'll finish the workup here because basically you were not going to do anything else except with the management that he's receiving. So where's the tumor from? We still think it's a lot. But it changed. Well, it it's changed, and we have several change. cases. And I haven't been able to find a reference of loss of TTF1 with chemotherapy or radiation. But finally, I got a case in which they described the loss of another marker, CD30, which is used in a carcinoma of the testis, embryonal carcinoma in the workup. And there is no question that the metastatic tumor had lost 
that, uh, that reactivity. So it could be there is that. It could be that the big tumor, it was a three centimeters tumor at that time, had several areas, clones, that are different one from the other. And those are the tumors that, uh, I mean, the clones are metastasized. <coughs> so basically, with all you know about the case, uh, I still think it's lung. We could do a couple of things to prove otherwise, but is it really necessary? You know, that's a question. Okay, well, um, let's, let's uh, finish up with Dr. Horvick. What do we do now? At this point, in general, radiation is, is recommended, although he's had uh, internal fixation, which may help with his pain. Primarily based on retrospective data, radiation is given for two reasons. There's some data that it helps stability of the device. So if the cancer grows, uh, he may have an unstable, the leg may become unstable. That's issue uh, number uh, one. Stop further destruction of bone. Correct. Issue number two is retrospective studies that have compared patients who've had radiation to those who don't. The patients who've had radiation have much better pain palliation. So that's probably the bigger reason. This gentleman actually went to a rehab facility after surgery. His pain progressed. Uh, finally, he came for radiation. Standard course of radiation is generally about two weeks of daily treatment. The, the range of radiation is a single high-dose treatment, and some people will treat for up to three weeks. When you do different lengths of treatment, you use different doses per day and try and get a biologic equivalence. What's the, what's the doses? Uh, 30 gray is probably the most frequently total used. Total 30 gray? Right. In the old nomenclature, it's 3,000 rads. Or, uh, some people will use 3,500, then you use smaller fractions. You can do 800 times one. The reality is pain palliation, whether you use 800 times one, 300 centigrade times 10 fractions, or 250 centigrade times about 14 fractions, the pain palliation in all cases is 70 to 80 percent. So 70 to 80 percent of patients have improvement. Of those 70 to 80 percent, approximately 50 percent have complete clearance of pain. And that can be judged on a few levels, either use of narcotics or just a patient's subjective score. So that the relief of pain is significant with radiation the difference between using a single treatment versus two weeks versus three weeks is the duration of pain control. The faster you do the treatment, although the pain will go away, the probability that it will come back within a few months is higher, so that the probability of retreating the patient is higher. With so, a single dose. With a single dose. So generally, we reserve the single fractions to patients whose survival is very poor. Most patients at most institutions will get about two weeks of treatment. Treatment is easy. It literally, the treatments per day take about three minutes. Door-to-door -door patients are in our department for 10 minutes. Other than some possible skin erythema, there are no side effects of this treatment. It's a very easy course of, uh, of, of radiation. How's the skin react with the single larger dose versus the more dose? More erythema. Actually, if you, the best studies are there, there's randomized prospective studies looking at fractionation, so those patients are followed thoroughly, and it's probably the most honest data. But you can actually see bone growth in about 50 to 60 percent of patients post radiation. So, higher, this is all of this is actually moderate dose radiation. It's not very high dose radiation where it's going to uh, destroy all of the blasts. They'll still, most of them will actually recover and you'll have the potential for new bone growth. So a very significant percentage of patients, radiographically, you'll see new bone growth occur. Do you see this with the, uh, the blood uh, cancers as well, myelomas? Interestingly, you can beat back the myeloma for, they are very, very radiation sensitive, so that you can kill the tumors very well with 
probably 50% of the dose, you can get an equal response in terms of pain 